All right, guys, thank you for joining us again for another episode of Three Comic Money and ComicBookInvest.com. Uh, this week, we uh, conveniently or maybe not so conveniently, we, we got to choose and we got uh, Mr. E.M. Gist with us, or Eric uh, Gist. He is, uh, if you don't know his stuff, you have not been reading Dark Horse or you have not been seeing some just ridiculously scary horror covers. I don't know if this is your niche. But you do some great stuff that I, when I started uh, follow, following you, I, actually, what really drew me in was your uh, your Instagram image, uh, huh? it, which is that Moon Knight that you did, which right, is right. just ridiculous. Yeah. Which is, by the way, a perfect time to talk about it because uh, Oscar Isaac's was announced yeah. uh, to be to be, <laughs> which we're all also really stoked about that as well. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, just tell us a little bit about you before we get just jumping into the show. Uh, you know, so basically, you know, like most kids my age, um, you guys look like you're all probably roughly in the same age group as me. Yeah. Um, you know, 42. I was into comics. Comics comics were huge, you know, you know, growing up in my teenage years, you know, pretty much 80s and early 90s kids, right? I mean, comics were the big oh, thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so that's kind of what I always wanted to do and uh, just always loved comics, you know, from the time I was probably about eight years old to now. Yeah. Um, so when I kind of got the chance to start picking what I wanted to do with my life, it was art. Um, I always wanted to do comics, but I didn't know how realistic that was. And I just kind of stuck with it long enough to where they ended up finally giving up and giving me some jobs. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that ended up being covers. I just kind of have a, more of a knack for a single image storytelling. Um, I, I'm okay at sequential stuff, but I think single image is definitely more my thing. Uh, so that was, that was kind of most, mostly it. Um, I went to a small school called uh, Watts Atelier of the Arts and actually I teach there now and mm -hmm. it's in uh, Encinitas, California. It's just a small private, like a uh, studio art school. Not even like a, like everyone will see it online or something. And they think it's like this big school. It's just a two room school mm -hmm. that, you know, 15 student classes. We run about 30 classes a, a, a session thereabouts. Um, uh, mostly teach life drawing, but a little bit of everything. And that's where I got most of my art education. And um, I don't know kind of how familiar you guys are with uh, painted comic illustrations. Um, I know it's kind of a, ni a niche thing. Uh, You're talking to Mr. Bronze Age. Uh, he's a Conan Red, Red Sonja fan extraordinaire. Yes. And thank you for thank you, and thank you for last week's cover on Conan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah well, it's such a kick to get to do Conan. Conan. I mean, obviously pretty much every artist in the world or every illustrator anyone want, and wants to paint Conan at one time or another. Um, and I got to paint him for quite a while. So that was cool. And, and there's more coming. So, uh, but yes, I'm nice. off being the, the regular artist as of 18, but then I still have quite a few others that are coming out uh, as well as some stuff that hasn't been announced yet that is not comic related, but should be fun. Cool. Uh, well, you, you got your uh, nullified one got announced to get what yeah. three weeks ago. Yeah, Nullified yeah. Conan is ridiculous. That was <laughs> fun. That was fun. That was a quick turnaround, but it was a lot of fun. In fact, I, I really didn't have time for it, but I, I squeezed <laughs> it in much to my uh, my wife's chagrin because it was just it was it's something you can't turn down. This is too uh, cool. I have to do it. Don't bother me for three days. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. The nice thing was as soon as I was done, we already had a vacation timed. Uh, so it's it pretty much I I got it done, turned it in, and we left on vacation for about four days. So it, it worked out. It worked out okay. Nice. Um, but anyway, the reason I brought that up is that uh, my teacher, Jeff Watts, and mm -hmm. now one of my best friends and my and my boss as well, his teacher was Glenn Orbick. And he did a ton of comic covers in the 90s, a lot of stuff for DC. Um, there's kind of the, the semi-famous one of, uh, of Impulse, and he's drawn a mustache on his own wanted poster on the wall back <laughs> in the 90s. And uh, oh. he did that. He did most of the, uh, the pulp noir covers that dc did back in the 90s that okay, were i do remember some covers. of those yeah yeah he did all he and his wife did all those or, or partner uh life partner uh, did uh did all those um unfortunately recently he passed away but uh but that was kind of my my lineage and i didn't even know that when i started studying at the school but as soon as i saw glenn stuff i was like that's what i want to do that's exactly <laughs> what i want to do um huge phil hale fan same thing you know great painted comic covers uh, Alex Ross. So I always grew up kind of into comics, but as soon as I saw those guys, I knew that that was, I, I was kind of like, I love comics and I wouldn't mind doing interiors, but whenever you talk to anyone who does interiors, it has to be your passion. Cause it's, I mean, yeah. illustration is, is hard. Comics are ridiculous. You know, yeah. deadline every day is, is, is nuts. Um, 
So I didn't know that I necessarily wanted to do that, although I'd like to dip my toe in it. I don't know that I want to, I wouldn't want to be a monthly comic book artist. So I kind of get the best of both worlds. I do, mm. a, I do a cover and then get to move on to the next thing, which is kind of perfect for me. <laughs> so, uh, so that's most of my story. And then I started off, uh, my first comic work was for uh, Boom when they first started up. Um, I did a, I did a cover for them. And then eventually through Guillermo del Toro, I got to do some Dark Horse covers. And then that led to some D, a little bit of DC work. Yeah, and those then, strange covers are fantastic. Oh, they are. That was a, that was a kick. That that will pretty much no matter what happens in the rest of my career, working on the strain is going to be a highlight of my career. That was just because <laughs> I was a huge fan of the novels before I yeah. even got to do the book covers. Mm. Uh, so when they contacted me, just out of in fact, I thought it was I thought it was one of my friends pranking me when I got the email. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally looked up the email and uh, and and made sure it was actually Guillermo del Toro's email. And yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I didn't, I didn't believe it. And, uh, for about a month, I didn't believe it. So when I finally actually got doing them, it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty much a highlight. And, and I think always will, I can't, re I can't imagine what I would do that would supplant that as being a highlight in my career. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so you, you shared with us and we're, we're going to show you sort of the slide and we're going to sort of do, uh, you talked about the game, and we're going to start, not the, well, the game, we're going to talk about, go around Robin talking about the books that you chose. You gave us a topic. Uh -huh. So sure. uh, Pete's going to throw it up so everyone else can see the topic that you chose. Okay. Uh, so our topic for today is possession comics. <laughs> so, what is that when you chose? Alien That's or <laughs> demonic. Yeah. Dealer's <laughs> choice. <laughs> So, Eric, why did you choose possession? Well, I mean, obviously, you're you got a horror background, but that that's a big part of it. I have a horror background. Um, comics and and horror movies are pretty much my my two things that I'm into. I mean, I'm pretty much into anything that would be a part of nerd culture, but but horror movies and comics are are my big things. I was watching slasher movies when I was way younger than I should have been watching slasher movies. <laughs> um, they all. I mean, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, when I was young, uh, two of my best friends, they were brothers and their parents got divorced and they moved in with his, not in with his grandpa, but they had sort of a, a, a granny flat or loft. I don't know what you would call it, but they basically had this sort of add on to the house that yeah. they pretty much was theirs. I mean, their mom <laughs> lived in the main house with their, with their grandpa. And then they had this sort of, like I said, sort of a granny flat that they lived in. And we walked into the local VHS store and the guy that was working there was 18. He didn't care what we rented. Um, so we pretty much rented, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and we just bring them home and then just watch them pretty much for 24 hours straight in, in their <laughs> granny flat. Um, and I was probably, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old at the time. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, so. I say that, but I was watching The Godfather when I was like seven. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and yeah. Honestly, What's the difference? My parents probably wouldn't even, at least my dad wouldn't have cared that much. I mean, my dad took me to see Alien. I mean, I don't think it was first release of Alien because I would have only been, what, five, four or five when that came out. So it definitely wasn't first round. But, you know, back when we were kids, you know, yeah. VHS wasn't really a thing yet. Even cable wasn't really a thing yet. So they re-released movies in theaters, popular yeah, movies in theaters all the time. So it was probably second or third run. So I was probably seven eight years old when i saw alien for the first time in the theaters my dad didn't to see that yeah right <laughs> so uh so two of my biggest favorite movies uh maybe my two favorite movies would be alien and exorcist um mm -hmm. so possession yeah. so when you said hey let's just throw in demon possession too i was like yeah great man awesome that's <laughs> you know i just kind of wanted to, i didn't know how specific you wanted to be but yeah if you want to throw demon possession in there too you know i'm i'm all for it uh, mm -hmm. So, and then I immediately knew kind of what I wanted to do. Uh, obviously, I worked on the AVP comic uh, for the Fire and Stone series. I did the covers for that, and so that was the cover you showed. But even uh, back when I was in, when I was a kid, uh, was it ninety when Aliens vs Predator came out? Whatever it was, ninety, ninety one, ninety two. Whenever the first AVP comic series came out, I still have those. In fact, I still have the Dark Horse Presents sort of prologues to that. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a ton of the comics from when I was a kid, but those are ones that I hung on to because huge fan of them. Um, so I knew I'd immediately go for that. Um, I was a huge brood fan in X-Men. Um, so that always freaked me out, uh, when I was a kid, I just, it, especially, uh, one of you even showed the cover, right? With, uh, with, uh, the Wolverine <laughs> yeah. one. I, I don't remember what number that is, but, uh, I, I think it was Silvestri that did that. And it's got Wolverine getting possessed. 
that co- that comic freaked me out when I was a kid. Uh, yeah. So I thought that was awesome. Well, see, I always, um, so. I always when you talk about the Brood and you talk about Alien, I always wanted to know which came first. Like I really wanted to go to the dates because the freaking Brood looked like the freaking Aliens Alien yeah. movie. Brood like, is clearly Claremont, and I think it was Burn that did Burn. the first one. Was it Burn and, Burn and uh, Claremont that did the, the actual first appearance of it? Yeah. Um, yeah I, I don't so. think it actually became kind of what we know as the, as the Brood until after Burn left, but but I think they were the one that originally came with Yeah, I think that was clearly their love letter to, to Alien. because I Wasn't think that, that was... was it the Christmas issue of Kitty Pride 143? What's the one where like the alien is coming, like she's going creeping at night time and says like Merry Christmas and Kitty Pride's oh, walking. Right. And there's a, that uh, that it's was like a, right after the, the beautiful right, right. Claremont run. Right, and right. And then it's like brood. <laughs> it's right. like for one issue. Right, right. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I always loved the brood. I, I didn't get back. That was kind of before my time when it first started, but obviously I went back and grabbed those once I got into it. Um, but yeah, I mean, when the brood first showed up, it was basically just like one little hitman character and mm. he was sort of there and he shot at him and then he was gone. Um, and then they brought it back a couple of issues later and actually introduced, you know, more what we know of as the brood with the brood queen. So that's the interesting thing, right? That's the question. Who came up with the idea of the queen? Oh, yeah. yeah. True. Because, because alien, 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 alien easily alien. predated brood. But the brood mm. queen predates the alien queen, so that's where you start getting, you know, which you know. <laughs> yeah, because alien is alien, alien is seventy nine. Right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, then and Uncanny X Men one forty three is nineteen eighty one. Right. You right. see, you're right. It is one eighty three, Chris. Yeah. One forty three. Alien. One forty three. Pardon me. One forty three. Nineteen eighty one. So it's two years later. But yeah. But right. then Aliens isn't until what, like nineteen eighty five? I want to say four, but right around there, mid eighties for yeah. sure. Eighty four, eighty five. So, I would say. So yeah. So the Queen Brood, the Brood Queen, would be before that. Yep. yep. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a relationship. It's the Swamp Thing Man yeah. Thing conversation all yeah. over again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. But I'll start there because then you got to go back to the heap. <laughs> yes, yeah. you're right. It's the heap. Good man. From Airboy. <laughs> the weird thing is, the two writers that created those two were roommates at the time, and they both say that they did not take it from each other, that it was just pure coincidence. But I'm sure they sat around talking about the heap or something like that and just kind of both came up with similar ideas. And Or they, they had like a loaf of bread in the corner of their the room that they just <laughs> right. Right. and right. drew for them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's let's jump in and see what books you chose and what books we we chose. So, uh, th- are we going to play the game and actually just do the randomness, or we just want to start? So oh, well, I already showed the card, so you already know where the card is. Oh, okay. So, uh, Mike, why don't you start us <laughs> off this time? Let's let's okay. just start with you. All right. Um, we went. I mean, so talking about childhood comics, I actually kept a bunch of my my childhood stuff and the stuff I was into as a kid. It's kind of a similar conversation. I like the really dark stuff. So I was reading like Sandman and Hellblazer and um, all that Vertigo stuff back then. And, uh, and I still kept, I, I kept that stuff. And I went back through and I saw this amazing possession cover. Uh, John Constantine look, doing an exorcism, I think. I, it's been a long time since I've read these, but just an awesome Dave McKean cover. I've not been able to feature Dave McKean on this show yet. And I, I love Dave McKean stuff, um, especially the earlier, more painted, less photographic uh, stuff that he did. Um, and this is a this is a fantastic example of that. And it is it's a kind of a beater because it is my like I don't know how old I guess I was probably ten when this came out something like that. But um, but yeah, but I'm not getting rid of that. And I, nor will I upgrade. <laughs> you know? Just a beautiful piece of art. I really like early early McKean, and um, uh, you know I, I I go nuts for it still. Sure, yeah, um, I love Meltdown, and that was him. And uh, who did yeah. he do that with? Uh, McKean, McKean did some meltdown, did meltdown as well. The Wolverine Havoc thing. He was part of that. Oh as well, yeah, so. yep. Yeah. Williams is that Williams? Yeah, yeah. Might be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that that little four issue thing is ridiculous. The Havoc and, and the guy he, he would do yeah. like fully painted interiors too. I oh mean, yeah, yeah. In those years, Christine. unbelievable amount of time those issues must have taken. I can't even oh, yeah. begin to think. Some of the stuff he did with Gaiman. And that where where it's like graphic novels and every panel is fully painted. Sinkevich yeah. used to do the same thing. The two of them. I don't. Yeah. Know, I don't know how long those things must have taken. But yeah. um, that was the thing back when time. Prestige was a Prestige format. They right, had right. like painted interiors, and it was like quality yeah. throughout, like cover to cover. There was a reason yeah. you were paying more for those books. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, e, let's see what let's see what your book is. Your oh, first book oh, will be. Oh, 
Well, it's not showing the right one. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it is the black Spider-Man 336. Uh, <laughs> right uh, now, the layout, for whatever reason, changed on me. But let's see what we got here. He you already brood. mentioned it, but let's talk yeah, a little yeah. more. Yeah, so it's the Brood uh, 162. And I love that because, again, at the time they had – this was sort of the reveal that the that the Brood uh, – uh, I would infected, possessed, implanted, whatever. You know, the alien ripoff thing, right? Only instead of it yeah. bursting out of you, it parasite. turned you into a Brood. Yeah, a parasite, right? And it, and it actually transforms you physically into the Brood. Uh, but obviously Wolverine being Wolverine – uh, the combination of his healing factor and his adamantium skeleton sort of fights off the, the transformation, right? But again, you don't really know that until I think pretty much, if not the last page, like the last two or three pages. And so you basically have him confused why he's uh, feeling so sick and the memories start coming back to him. And it's sort of a, in a way, sort of a, a flashback episode mm -hmm. framed by his slow uh, sort of fall into delusion. And he's having he's having hallucinations. He passes out, goes in and out of consciousness, um, and then eventually he overhears them and he finds figures out that he's actually implanted with a brood queen, right? Um, and just the whole thing, this really interesting framing element that goes back and forth, is uh, is really interesting. Plus, it was in the early days of of Wolverine's uh, essentially immortality. Before that, he was just a dude yeah. that kind of healed fast. Um, yeah. But this is when they really started kind of coming into it. It's like he basically can't be killed by, you know, normal physical means. He pretty much heals from everything. Yeah. Um, so I just think, I just thought just the, 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 I mean, the visual storytelling in it is great, but the actual writing of it, it, I think, is some of the best writing that Claremont ever did, where it's just this sort of over the course of the issue, it's like, okay, he's sick, but then he actually starts having delusions and hallucinations and all the while doing his Wolverine thing and, you know, he even utters, you know, the I'm the best at what I do line, you know, as he <laughs> frequently does. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just really interesting that that sort of that storytelling of the framing element along with this sort of chase scene on this alien planet. That's uh, that's that's really interesting and even kind of harkens back a little bit to Robert Rodriguez's uh, Predators a little bit. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it, I don't know. There's just a lot of cool elements in it that that I thought that were sort of formative of one of the major X-Men foes as well as Wolverine himself. He kind of, that was sort of the period when he was becoming what we now know as Wolverine um, from just sort of this dude that scraps and is hard to kill to being, you know, borderline immortal. Yeah. Or maybe even full on immortal now. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> now you me have to go back and read it with that perspective. Like that just because uh, my, my Wolverine and X-Men knowledge is not sequential. So it's like, it, it honestly actually starts with the cartoon. And then I have to go back and go, okay, what is actually lore versus cartoon? Like, I could have sworn the brood was a major part of the cartoon. But actually, it's like <laughs> one image in like one episode, right. do you actually get the brood. But I convinced myself that's where I knew about the brood. I don't know. How, <laughs> what, maybe there's an Aliens cartoon that I intermingled with X-Men in my head. But... <laughs> well, now as of Hickman, every X-Man is immortal. Technically, well, that's true. we'll see where they're going with that. I can't Cobalt. imagine they're going to have that stick Cobalt. around. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, it's cool for now, but if that sticks around for five, six years, that's going to get old real quick. Yeah, yeah, right. so. yeah. Although I do like that whole idea behind X Factor that they're doing, that they actually have to go and prove that the person's dead. I think that's a great premise for a, for a comic. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. All right, Pete, what you got? Well, let's see here. Well, I'm going to stick with this you know, theme as we were talking because I do have the 234. And even though I use this on, I forget what category we did back on the old show or old version of the show, I had to go with this one because this is just a gorgeous image that Sylvester gave us with, you know, the brood basically taking over Wolverine, you know, to a point. It's just fantastic. I don't know. I just can't get this image out of my head. And every time I find it in a dollar bin, I buy it. So I've got to have like 15 <laughs> or 20 of these things in varying condition. I don't care how beat up they are. I get them every time. Well, it's, it's that one. Here's a, here's a Portuguese version of the same thing, just because oh, yeah. I, I, you got to show it as well. But yeah. uh, that cover, and then it was the, the one with him on the cross. Like both of those are oh, not yeah. worth anything, but you always grab it. Hmm? Maybe 250 or 251, I think yeah, that one is. I think you're right. It's just yeah. something about that run. Basically, anytime Wolverine's on the cover from 130 to ever, <laughs> you buy him just because it's Wolverine. Well, there's a reason why Sylvester went to Wolverine after 
he left yeah. when he left <laughs> X-Men. I mean, uh, clearly one of his favorite, if not his favorite character. Oh, yeah. So, very nice. Okay, well, for myself, uh, it's slightly different uh, view. No, I'm go <laughs> with Black Hammer and Justice League with Starro all over the cover. Oh, Starro. Um, mainly because in the story, like it's, I mean, it's a, cr- a crossover event, but it's Jeff Lemire who does these just great, great little, but it's a great crossover between justice league and black hammer world that he created. But in this issue or whatever, it's, I mean, look at all the little stars, the aliens, and they land <laughs> on the head, that image you get all the time now of the, the brain sucking alien sitting on top of the head. Um, I think actually a Conan cover just had this freaking, I don't know. I didn't read the issue, so I have no clue if it had anything to do with it, but, uh, where it, uh, you did the cover. Um, it was the variant. It had the alien on the head, and then uh, it was the secret variant had the alien off the head. That was the difference between the two covers. Uh, it just happened. It was last month's Conan issue. So, of course, there's like seven or eight variants for issue number 13 yeah, or yeah, 12. Right. So it's hard <laughs> to keep track of them. Um, but, no, like, I, I just like, like, when I think of aliens, I either think of, the alien coming out of the stomach, like uh, from the movies, or I think of something sucking my brain. And like when I think of possession, that's sort of what I think of. So I was <laughs> glad to have this. The of course, I mean, then of course, this is the famous first uh, Justice League picture or whatever is what twenty eight, uh, Brave and the Bold, or twenty six. One of those. Yeah. Yeah. Starro is the big bad guy on that cover. So, but yeah, so that's what the alien possession. Just because I. That takes over the the body and soul of the person or whatever. And I don't know what it is that freaks people out, freak, freak, freaks people out in about like star or squid type forms, but that seems to be a lot. Like even the face hugger from Alien. Oh yeah. And oh. Uh, one of the ones that I'm going to be talking about coming up here, um, which I won't <laughs> give that away, but um, that's in there. Um, what was the? There was a uh, one of the Image comics for when it first started out. The one of the characters had like a symbiotic alien star oh, that yeah. attached to him and uh oh so wild star wild star that's it yeah so that seems to be a weird kind of well have you ever seen thing. um freaking octopuses are freaking uh awesome and scary at the same time have you ever seen the <laughs> ones that are like the camouflage ones like yeah, they yeah. legit disappear completely yeah. and then all of a sudden you get zoom in and they pop out of nowhere and you're like what the hell like <laughs> i can't imagine if i was a scuba diver and all of a sudden i come up to what i think is a coral growing and it's really a squid just coming out of the thing. I mean, right. <laughs> and it's defending its turf with the, ah! and it's one of the freakiest things of old school science teachers. You know, you had those jars sitting on their little baby octopus in a jar and everything. Or at least my mom did. She saw fourth grade science. I just remember going up and they're like, this is the coolest. And the sk- why does my mom have this on the shelf? The little baby squid sitting right there. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing as a skull, the whatever, like moon Knight and everything. Sure. So. Hmm. All right, Mike. What's your second pick? All right, so I, I punted, right? So I was gonna I was gonna be snarky, and I was gonna say, punted. well, technically, uh, black suit Spider Man is uh, he's possessed by a symbiote. I said, you know, that's cop out. So uh, and I, I went back to my initial thought, but I couldn't find the book I initially wanted. Then I realized I had this, and I, I am not a huge fan of this artist, generally speaking, but I love this cover. This is he has, the, he has some good work, and not this all is. Of it. Maybe his best, although I love the one with uh, Wolverine's like uh, soul coming out uh, uh, off the halo, the halo Wolverine. That's a good one too. But this is a uh, this is a, a particularly sought after book. But it's it's just a fun cover. This is what I want everything Scotty Young to look like, and it, and it hardly ever does <laughs> to me. Um, but this, I I love this book, and this is the only Scotty Young book I've kept. But uh, I guess the first Venom pool. Um, you know, it's exactly what it is. It's it's just silly, campy, Deadpool-y, Scotty Youngish stuff, um, and just just a fun book. So. so that's a case of the cover and the interior is looking completely different. And yeah, to be honest, I'm not a fan. Of the interior it's a really hard read just because I'm not a fan of the style, of the in- interior art. I could live with Scotty doing the entire book, but like because the the, the the character, it just didn't work reading the stories. And I think actually. That's the one that's worth anything, but he actually, it's actually, a, that combines four issues. It was the what ifs. There's four what ifs that had little bits and pieces of that story, and then they made it into one book. So yeah. it's technically not the first appearance of Venom Pool, but, right. but it's the only one that's worth anything. Right. He's <laughs> got the cover. For some reason, it's difficult to find, although, I oh, mean, yeah. it, it, can't, it can't be that low of a print run. I can't imagine it's that low, but, um, but it, is, it is tough to find. So anyway, that was mine. 
All right, let's see what E has here. All right, so for pick two. Wait to see what we have. Ooh. Invincible 40. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, it's funny because Invincible, I didn't really get super into until recently. And, hey, right there and I, I figured out quickly why that was because when I first uh, read it, I sort of followed through the first, I guess what would amount to the first two trade back, paperback, so roughly the first mm -hmm. year. And I thought, oh, this is kind of cool, but it's basically – biting on eric larson real hard why don't i just go read eric larson stuff yeah and and then i found and then when i went back and read them recently you know you read the backup information you read the forwards and you find out why it's biting on eric larson so hard and then you also figure out that round about that third trade paperback the first 12 issues are essentially prologue to what the series is really about right it's not just a standard superhero story it goes way more than that but anyway when it finally gets to this i just thought this was the the coolest thing ever and obviously it has a uh, a martian manhunter analog to it but mm. the whole idea that the the evil possessing aliens are actually the victims was i thought a really interesting twist that it's sort of the standard sort of invading aliens that take over your mind and ooh, scary you know saying mm. you know again the story that's been told a million times but then you actually find out that they that they were actually enslaved by the shape-shifting martian race because the sequids couldn't take them over because they're shapeshifters um i just thought that was that was really uh, an interesting twist on, and that's what Inf invincible's right uh, all about right i mean pretty much the book over and over again plays into these tropes and has a setup that you're very very familiar with and you've seen in books a million times but then turns on its head and does something yeah. does something different with it um and you actually kind of almost feel sorry for the sequids to a certain degree. <laughs> I mean, they're still not, you know, the, the nicest aliens in the world, but you, you kind of get their side of it. Which, whereas the Xenomorph, yeah. you're never going to get the Xenomorph <laughs> side. There is no side, right? He just, they just kill. That's what they do. Well, they yeah. need, they need the bodies. To... Yeah, yeah, right. How's the chest burster? <laughs> That's, I, I, see, I hadn't, even, I haven't read that far into Invincible. I read like the, I guess made the first, compendum -dum or whatever you know like the 18 issue book or whatever i read that one i loved it's uh it's more also it's just fascinating to me that kirkman was writing that and walking dead at the same time right and i think he was doing marvel team up he was doing shoot i mean writers amaze me sometimes they can have seven different trains of thought and not maybe they do crossover and you just really have to analyze their writing to identify whether or not they cross over um uh, but yeah, he was doing Walking Dead and, and Invincible pretty much at the same time, and mm -hmm. no one cared, cared at all about Invincible or Walking Dead the first like fifteen issues. It wasn't until like right. the next year. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah but that's a I had, I have not read that far into. It. I know like issue forty four right after that's the Anissa or whatever the the punching cover or whatever that the bloody knuckles and everything. But I, I know what's what's collectible, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, all right, so where are we at? Peter, is this you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right, let me go and grab my second book here. Losing track of my uh, cursor here to find a, the button on the screen. All right, so my next pick, I actually, <laughs> just by coincidence, I'm also going with a Venom cover there, Mike. But this one is kind of unrelated. I don't want to say unrelated to the story, but the cover really doesn't match anything that happens in the book. But I like this Daredevil, you know, cover, like... I know Stephanie Hans kind of used a similar image in her variant for that X Men yeah. blue, X Men blue, yeah. that yeah. blue one, yeah. But this is just great. I mean, Scott McDaniel here, it's just a different vibe for him. Especially he does the interiors, but the interior is more of that kind of like heavy black, like Frank Miller esque kind of like look inside. But this has more of like a painted quality on the on this cover, and I just dig it. Like it's just a fantastic image to me. So even though Venom never takes over Daredevil in the book. It's just a cool image, so that's why. I <laughs> well, that's one you always find in dollar bins and everything, yep. but it's it makes you go, "What the heck?" Like that because that Daredevil run up till that is, uh, it's okay. That cover's amazing, and then it's uh, like, I don't know, it was, it was like you could tell it changed artists, and of course that was what mid nineties, and that's when the nineties got yeah. weird when comics like yeah. that's where then it was all about that new going. black suit that he was wearing. So like we're just gonna sell it because he's got a new armored suit, so we don't need to tell. It. That's all the big. You know, selling point for Daredevil was at the time was his new suit. Well, that was when Image scared the crap out of everybody, and they were doing whatever yeah. they could to hang on to their market share. So, oh, yeah. exactly. Who, who could we kill? 
<laughs> yeah, who can we kill? <laughs> Whose costume can we change? You know, yeah. they had me. They had me so much by the balls. Image did. I can remember waiting. Man, am I the only one that waited the six months between every pit issue? <laughs> no, you're not alone. Oh, it could just and I could still not would. wait. I yeah, still would. I, I loved it. I, I know. I'm like, I'm just gonna sit. I'm just gonna sit here at the comic shop. I'll just wait. Wait, it's coming. I know it's coming. It's, is that, it's Pitt Platt who never takes no, seven years to no. do it. Uh, Pitt was uh, uh, Dale, Dale Keown. Keown? Yeah, yeah, Dale Keown. What, did, what was Platt doing? Was he profit. doing profit? Profit. Platt That's did profit. Um, and then he was also, he did part of the uh, Fighting American for Life I mean, that was when it jumped over yeah. to Awesome. Uh, so, yeah. He still He's, sneaks the occasional cover out every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, here recently, like. Wow. It, but he must have to, he must, he must get like a year's notice because it takes him so like, cause that was what the moon Knight run he did. And you're just like, come on, finish this. And you're like, okay, they just quit using them because he took so long to do the covers. <laughs> well, it's so detailed. Like the line, oh, I mean, they're fantastic. The lines he puts in there. It's just, and from what I understand, he works huge. Like gigantic. Oh, does he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, have I don't to. know if that's still true, but I know back in the day he would do the, whatever the, the twice up instead of only oh, okay. uh, 1.5, he would do actually twice up. Like like uh, Eric Larson's doing now. How how wow. big do you how big do you work? Do you work uh, digitally or by hand? No, I, I work uh, hand painted, um, and my my painted covers are usually sixteen by twenty four. So, okay. I mean that's oil okay. painted, so it's 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 different than doing like a bunch of little tiny ink catching. That would that would I would never I would work the same as everyone else does eleven by seventeen <laughs> if I did that. Are are you uh, uh, are you have, are you influenced by uh, Go Ghosts of the? Oh like, yeah. the Monsters of Filmland, because oh, I mean, the stuff that you're doing absolutely. lately is so freaking cool, uh, and it's yeah. and it's so reminiscent of that style from those covers. That uh, Go Ghost actually comes from my artistic lineage, actually, and I didn't know this till long, long after. Um, so the the sort of whatever lineage or methodology art family that I come from is called the, the Riley method. It was started by a guy named, a guy named Frank Riley at the uh, not to get too much into you know nerdy art. His no, we, lo we love that. Go, 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 go. That's good <laughs> um, stuff. But he, uh, he, he sort of be, he popularized a certain method of, of drawing. Some say he developed. There's, there's some debate about that. But, um, but he taught at the art students. He was the main art instructor, Art Students League, like early, mid-1900s. And Gogos was actually one of his students for a couple years. I don't know if Gogos really considers himself a Riley student, but he did study with him uh, for okay. a while. But he was kind of the guy that took sort of the European classical kind of uptight uh, method of working and then combined it with the American illustration tradition of the Brandywine and sort of infused it with this energy and excitement. And guys like James Bama came from there. I mean, just tons and tons of illustrators came out of that, that, uh, that lineage. And that's kind mm -hmm. of where I came from. So uh, Riley taught Fred Fixler. Fred Fixler uh, taught Glenn Orbick. Glenn Orbick taught uh, Jeff Watts. Jeff Watts taught me. And on and on down the line. Uh, it's a really yeah. striking style, especially for horror. I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. It just it just has the impact that that those characters should have. It's it's great, and you're doing a great. I met him a couple of times too. Sweetest guy in the world. Oh, cool. Super super nice guy. That's really cool. It's almost like an NFL coaching tree. Like all right, he's in the coordinator. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like, <laughs> all, yeah. Do thing and yeah. Well, yeah. that awesome. doesn't. I was actually I was watching uh the other day the Baltimore Comic Con and they had like some of the old school artists all on there like Sankovich and uh Dennis Cowns and uh Simonson all like the Chicken. art heroes from the eighties were all right. sitting around the table together talking and they were talking and I didn't it didn't dawn on me back then people had apprenticed and you sure. guys worked under. And I don't know if you, I mean, as a teacher, of course, you have people that work, that not necessarily work under you, but you're training how to do it. Sure. Nowadays, I don't feel like that happens. I don't feel like, I feel like artists, they, they go to school, they get, they get trained to whatever school. Like we've had a couple of guys on who went to Joe Kubert school and right. things like that. And it's been fascinating talking to and learning how the different, like what you just shared is so fascinating to me of your lineage. Like I hadn't even thought of that. Of like, well, I was yeah. under this person. I was under that person. And knowing that you probably are teaching some students that if they choose to go into comics books, or maybe you've already had a few, you know, hey, uh -huh. this person, I, I they came through my school, I taught them, whether or not they are your style, they, they might right, have right. come through more, you. More gaming, um, none of my students have gone into uh, comics directly yet, but a ton of them work on like Magic the Gathering and do book covers yeah. and, 
and things of that sort. Um, so, I mean, I don't, are you guys really that familiar with that side of things? Or are you mostly comic guys? Mostly we comic are guys. Comic but, guys. I guess. but one yeah, of our uh, main guys who, uh, uh, he's a, he was big into Magic the Gathering as far as collecting and he had his website and everything. Uh, so he, he, he told, when I, when I said you were going to be on the show, he was like, oh yeah, I've got this card and that card. And uh, <laughs> well, speaking, although, although I did play a bunch of the fantasy flight games. Which I okay. think you were you worked on some of that stuff. Didn't I did you? a few, yeah. I did a few cards for the uh, the Warhammer one. Uh, okay, not a ton, but a, a few for the Warhammer one. Yeah, they it's they, they choose great. Well. They choose great artists for that stuff. I played the Star Wars games primarily, um, yeah, yeah. But, but man, some of that some of that art is some of the best Star Wars art there is. And a lot of those oh, yeah. guys will come to celebration with their canvases of the actual art from those cards and everyone just does an Oz because almost half the people in the convention plays the, you know, play the games. So, right. um, but to see that stuff for real, the real paintings of that stuff is, is really pretty awesome. Cause you know, you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, I got sure. half of a card that's this big. <laughs> I, the art, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really do it justice in that, in that size right. format. So to see, you know, a, a huge canvas of Boba Fett, <laughs> the card that you've yeah, been playing absolutely. every hand for however yeah. long it's pretty cool so well even outside the gaming cards i remember back in the 90s when they had the trading cards that they sold like what the marvel masterpieces most yep. of those were like painted you had the hildebrands you had yeah. just go like well that's all coming back they're, they're, all, they're, yeah. they're doing marvel masterpiece again and they and they started up i did some cards for uh for flarium and i'm gonna be doing some more yeah. um so yeah they're they're actually bringing all that back they do a, a marvel masterpiece series i think like every other year now, something like that. And my buddy oh Dave Palumbo just did the most recent one. one. That's oh. cool. That'll suck money out of my wallet. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's, it's one piece of art. It's like you, you have to, that's what you got. You're one little image. Yeah. And, and you got to sell I, it on and, that. And it's Pete, crazy. I know you had the X-Men set with all the Jim Lee art in it. Oh, absolutely. I oh, still man. have that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kept mine too. I, I have too. mine still. Because it had all the stats on the back, the first appearances and everything. And for all of you yeah. listening out there, it lists Hulk 180. As <laughs> the first appearance of Wolverine, just so you know. <laughs> Moving I'm on. Covered either way. <laughs> well, uh, right before we move on. So h- how does it feel, though, that you said you draw, you, you make these paintings in 16 by 24 or whatever size. Right. And then you go, and now it's this big. Everyone pre- appreciates it now. And it's the size of a big, like, <laughs> I, like Mike said, sometimes it doesn't do it justice. Like, have you ever gone... Oh, I probably that was a lot of work for. I can't even tell it's a tree anymore, or whatever it is. <laughs> for for cards, I generally paint a little bit smaller. Um, Magic because there's such a great aftermarket for it, and I don't do a ton of them, so I can still do them pretty decent size, but not quite that big. But right in that range, when I do the cards, um, those are usually like 11 by 14, 12 by 16. I'd love to do them bigger, but they usually you know email you up and say. Hey, we need eleven cards. We need them in six weeks or whatever, eight weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, while I would still love to do them each, you know, cover quality, there's just not the time to do it. Um, so, yeah, those generally end up being a little bit smaller. You got to lose a little bit of that detail too once you have to shrink it down so small. Like a lot of the work you put yeah. in doesn't get to you know shine through. Yeah. So I mean, right. so why even at that point if you're going to lose it anyway in the transfer? Seems like an awful waste of time, especially with a deadline like that. The, the aftermarket that that's that's why you do it <laughs> the yeah, you can you're sell doing, that piece you know, yep someone yep. will come to a con and buy a buy a poster or a print and it, and they, they've got that little extra information in there or someone wants to buy the original and you know so again mm-hmm. it's just kind of bringing it's the same thing i mean if i don't know uh if you guys have ever seen any of norman rockwell's paintings in person but they're person. so much nicer than whatever was ended up printed on the cover and you, you do it partially for yourself but you also do it just Mostly for yourself, really, to be honest. Um, and if that leads to an aftermarket value, then great. But uh, well, at least the Saturday evening, at least the Saturday evening post was a big magazine. So, right, but his paintings good. are big. His paintings are, are like thirty by forty sometimes. So oh, I mean, wow. he painted really big. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the Saturday evening post. Uh, you know, I mean, like you said, at least that's a that's a good you know, good size. A lot more real, a lot cover. more real estate than a magic card. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> All right, well, I'll finish off our second picks here. Uh, once again, I'm going for inside the book more than outside. Uh, this book became popular mainly because of her, oh, wrong side, uh, because of her Galactica, the female Galacticus. But uh, this is, I, I grabbed this because of Elsa uh, Bloodstone on here, not Elsa from Frozen, but uh, Elsa Bloodstone. <laughs> and uh, this issue is weird and disturbing and awesome all at the same time. 
But the big, big thing on the issue is she gets infected with a demon alien and he's basically impregnated, sort of like, uh, and then she basically pukes up the baby. <laughs> it's just wrong, like an wow. all sides. And she goes through that entire process of, and it uh, goes through details like what's happening to her and why she's getting rid of it and everything. But it's just, it's such just a me- messed up story. And I've I've been high. I'm, I know Pete, you've been high on Elsa Bloodstone being just. Yeah. When are they going to use her? She's a fantastic character. All these monsters. I can't I can't wait until Werewolf by Night takes off again, and mm-hmm. uh, they bring Frank Drake back for T- Tomb of Dracula. And just all these great characters that they're hinting at i mean shoot uh e you did uh those great ravencroft covers uh that yeah. the goblin one and uh you could tell the they marvel is just trying to see if they can push horror out again and i'm so oh, excited yeah yeah well didn't was it was elsa in she was in something recently was it was uh, she, she in wolverine or was that a different character yeah she was, she in, was deadpool. in deadpool it was yeah yeah she married deadpool, or not married but they did four issues when he was king of monsters Right, right. Yeah. But it wasn't quite as, it didn't give that scary feel. It was that right. comedy. But uh, there's actually, there's a beautiful cover, the Copper Tone cover that I don't know if, where it, uh, <laughs> it, it features her and Deadpool had the, the old homage to the Copper Tone uh, getting the uh, bathing suit pulled down. Right. But, it, uh, but yeah, <laughs> that one's there. But no, she was in that and she was, uh, what was she in after? Oh, then she had her own little Legion of Monsters when they tried back 2011, 12, when, uh, What's his face? Le- Le- that became really hot there for a second because J- Jared Leto was holding up the book while he's walking through Morbius, and, and everyone, oh my god, they're gonna do oh, Legion! Oh, oh that's yeah, right. the, the newer Legion of Monsters. Yeah, the newer that version. That one that has that awesome Greg Land uh, Satana cover though on the sec the in that yeah. same yeah. run. Yeah, I love that cover. Like uh, that's a, yeah, yeah. So, but that, that's the one after it. So if you could pick a Marvel monster, who would you be the one you'd want to do? You mean you mean for for just a one single illustration, or to be the regular cover? Like artist? to do like the a five issue run or a four issue. That would be a tough one. Uh, if it were if it's just a single illustration, I would go with Man Thing for sure. Like if you ask me, you know, and I painted him once. Um, so if it were a one time thing, I don't know how appealing doing a five issue miniseries would be with him. Um, so it would probably be. I guess depending on how broadly you would define a monster, I would actually love, I actually have an idea for a doppelganger miniseries. I don't know if you'd necessarily consider him a Marvel monster exactly. So wait, but... go, go further into doppelganger. Like... Uh, so doppelganger is that weird uh, demon Spider-Man character. Yeah, eight... Okay, so the Marvel. one you did the cover for. Yeah, uh, the one you that I did the cover for. I would okay, actually I, love to I do thought that was, so I was like, him. okay. So, so be, yeah, I would love to do a story like that that's that's more in the vein of Universal Monsters where it's a sympathetic monster and you actually end up feeling sorry for him type of mm-hmm. thing. Um, so I, I kind of have an idea for that, and I may pitch it at some point to see if they'll let me do, you know, either, <laughs> either an issue of, of Ravencroft or, or a miniseries or something. I don't know how likely that is, but I, I have what I think would be a pretty cool story for him that would actually give him a background because he doesn't really have – his story is basically that hey, he's this yeah. cool-looking version of Spider-Man. He, other than yeah, that, he doesn't exactly. really have much personality. So yeah, I just remember those few issues from Web of Spider-Man, like when he appeared, mm-hmm. and that's about it. I think I, I might have the toy here somewhere, but like that, it was <laughs> yeah, more. They, they brought a, him back at some point and had this weird uh, family aspect with uh, Scream and Carnage and and him, where it was like this weird mm. father. <laughs> <laughs> mother son thing that was kind of weird but yeah so yeah they, they i don't think they've really used him effectively i think they just know he looks cool and he sells toys and you know yeah. i think he's much more p- popular in the peripheral elements because he's just a cool looking version of spider-man yeah. well the slate's clean then you can tell that story <laughs> right yeah, yeah that's what i'm thinking right <laughs> all right mike what, what you got for your third pick here okay so so kind of piggybacking off what you said, I'm really hoping that DC will do the same thing. And they have done a really great job with their justice league dark series. And I know that, I know that there's not a lot of people reading it. I don't know why Tinian was writing it for a while. Um, it's now Rom V or Rom five or Ram five or however you say that uh, writing it now, but it's still great. And it crossed over with wonder woman when wonder woman got possessed by Hecate. Uh 
so I call her a witch or a demon or whatever you want to call her. And it's right at the time that this came out, this cover came out. I love that person. Oh, the witching hour. That one of my um, the one. I, and this is what got me hooked on Jenny Frisson. And this this came out literally like a week before I met Jenny and did an interview with her. And she told me that this was her favorite thing to draw for Wonder Woman was the witchy. She called it the witchy Wonder Woman, the witchy dark one. And there's a couple of these. There's this one, the next issue. Then there's the crossover one shot issue. And then there is a cover on Justice League Dark as well that has it. Um, but this was always my favorite. And it was so much my favorite that I had to then talk to her about doing this. So I own the art for that cover. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, which, I mean, you know, I love the way that that she does this, her style and her her um, her her process for doing sort of the line art and then scanning the line art in, printing it back out really light and then doing the rendering with whatever she uses on that particular thing, color pencils, uh, chalks, um, you know, those sorts of paint, all kinds of things. And then scanning that back in, photoshopping the color <clears throat> and, and that kind of thing. So um I'm really proud to own the art of it. It is one of my favorite covers. It's a really, really great story. The, uh, and speaking of like sympathetic monsters, the uh, the good guys, half of the team is monsters. It's Man Bat and it's um, Swamp Thing and um, Detective, you got, Chimp. Uh, Detective Chimp. And I mean, it's, it's just chock full of monsters. It's awesome. And, and of course you got all kinds of demon stuff going on. John Constantine's in it. I mean, it, it's, it's great. I hope they make it into something. There's been a lot of talk about it. Um, I'd really love them to use the Zatanna character better. Did JJ say he was interested? There for yes. A yeah, and I mean, in the Wonder Woman movies of, you know, well, who knows about 84 if we'll ever even get to see the damn thing, but um, the first <laughs> movie was so good um, and, and Gal Gadot is so great as Wonder Woman that I think it, it would just be, it seems like perfect timing to do that whole thing, make it into a, you could do a series, you could do a movie, yeah. you could do multi, multiple movies. The yeah, book is Guillermo, great. Guillermo del Toro was supposed to do it, and then it kind of just dropped like after yeah. a while. But that would have been perfect. I think that fell a victim of the whole uh, interconnected universe thing. Uh, yeah. Because his was really very much a standalone movie. And, yeah. uh, and as they kind of saw what Marvel was doing in Marvel making, just literally printing money, um, that's yeah. kind of, they fell victim to that because I don't think he wanted to necessarily curb his vision to fit in. That's what I heard. And I'm still Dude, disappointed sort of we never got his third Hellboy. Like I like the new Hellboy. It wasn't bad, but I really wanted Del Toro's mm -hmm. third Hellboy movie, like so badly. Yep. yep. Just never got it. I actually did a Justice League Dark cover. Did you? Which one? Yeah, it was uh, one of the. Uh, so a few years ago, when they were doing the, I don't know what they called them, but the Halloween variants, the the monster variants. Oh, uh, I did right. I did one of those, and actually in a similar technique, even where I did a graphite rendering and then scanned that in and did digital colors on it. Um, so yeah, I did that back God, probably. So that was part of the new 52. You did yes. the, the, the Halloween variants. I remember that there's yes. some really great ones that, that came out. Mm -hmm. so, I, did, and, I did two of them. I did that one. And then, and then I did a death stroke the next year that was sort of death stroke as Jason Voorhees. So yeah, ooh. those are my two DC covers. I, I've that seen I've that one. I'm looking at the Justice League Dark now. Of course, I am. Because, <laughs> Don't worry, I'll, I'll because put an image right, right in the middle. Every week on this show, I have to buy something while we're on the show. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it just seems to be the way it's been going lately. So uh, I know. Oh I dang! You you did like is sepia tone? Yeah. Find it. Yeah. Well, I'm not, not for sale. I just googled the image. Would oh dead man and swamp thing. Oh, and Constantine looks like death. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> Yeah, they wanted it uh, like uh, my idea was to take all of them and Frankenstein them as if they had all been in sort of, sort of horrible accident and then got stitched together. Mismatched. Oh, I see that now. So you got arms switched on the characters. Oh, dang, <laughs> Mike, you're buying this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what what is it? It's it's just Thirty five from New Thirty Five. Okay, of the of the New Fifty Two series, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Man. All right. Nice. While, while you go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, who just went? Uh, I did. Oh yeah. So let's see what uh, Eric's last pick is. All right, Zayla, that's right. So I got your last pick ready, and it is going back to what we talked about. <gasps> oh my god, this is Yeah. So I. I, just, I love this whole series. So what, what I'm about to say isn't a condemnation of the whole series at all. But the first issue is basically a standalone issue. It, again, it's, it's, like a, it's like a prologue, right? It's, 
it doesn't really get into the main characters of the, of the series at all. Um, but it's basically two humans having a discussion about um, he, the proper place for humans in the universe, right? Are we too reliant on technology? Are we just going in and sort of harvesting these planets without giving any thought to the damage we might be causing to, you know, a lot of stuff that gets talked about now. Like this was, you know, whatever, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And it's interesting because it sort of starts off almost... I mean, I'm sure it was it was on purpose with the writer, but the the character is inadvertently drawing parallels between the human race and the xenomorphs, mm-hmm. essentially calling us parasites. That we're just <laughs> kind of going through the going through the universe. We infect a planet, use it for what we want, and then leave. Yeah, um, your resources. Right, <laughs> and yeah. and it, the other character ends up uh, again. The writer's doing it on purpose, but the other character inadvertently compares us to the whatever the predator's real name is. I can't remember what they're called. We'll just call him Predator. And yeah. they uh, basically how they've sort of they eschew technology at the time. I mean, they're obviously very technologically advanced, but they curb their technology depending on the situation to make it fair and get back to their sort of primal, their primal, more basic roots. And he's talking about, well, maybe that's what we should do. It's kind of curb this growth for a while and just kind of settle in and develop these planets rather than just go in, you know, let's go back to almost like uh, frontiersman type days. And stop relying on technology to basically just, you know, harvest what we want. Um, and he talks about, you know, maybe she's going to get get out of the whole, you know, space game and settle down on a planet and, you know, become a farmer or whatever. Yeah. And uh, it's it's just really interesting that when you start looking into it a little deeper, it's not just these two guys having a, a technology versus not technology argument, but literally comparing the two different paths that humans can take to the two different paths that the two main alien races uh, cause and then it, you know it cuts away to the predators it cuts away to the aliens and eventually you know the predators uh it shows the predators uh essentially seeding planets with the alien eggs and then hunting the aliens right so that's kind of the, one of their rites of passage um and it's just really interesting and then the the actual real story starts in issue two where you actually start to learn you know find out about the the sort of pioneers and the and the farmers and you know that it actually gets into the actual story proper but that first issue you could literally just read that issue and it's a it's sort of a self-contained little vignette mm-hmm. um and i just think again i just think it's a it's it's an amazingly uh uh deep piece of writing for you know 1990s comics you know back when that cover is know, that a dave dorman is that a dorman cover no that is i don't think it's dorman maybe it is i i, uh, I don't think dorman was doing them yet I was looking for it when you were talking. I was looking for it because I found one recently, and it was right around here. So oh while God. while they're thinking, I don't know if, how often you hit our site up. We have a guy who right now every Sunday drops another bit of he calls it the, the Valverde incident. Uh, one, oh, two, three, four, five, and he's basically go running through every one of the alien stories, and then he's about to pick up every <laughs> one of the predators and dropping like he breaks down the timeline. And he goes through. I think this past issue, he he just touched on all the re- amazing um, the Marvel, Marvel covers that are about to come out. Right, right. Um, I don't yeah. know, did you get to do any of those, or did you no, beg to do any of those? Sadly, no. I I begged <laughs> and begged and begged, but <laughs> I don't have enough pull yet. Oh, it's opportunity missed for Marvel. <laughs> We'll maybe see. there's I'm a sure maybe there's a way to a lot too. of like alien stuff. So <laughs> they're actually saving you for the series when they decide to actually do the series. <laughs> so <laughs> there we go. That'd be good. You joke, but it'll probably happen. <laughs> I, I'm just waiting for the call. Mini. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the call. <laughs> do you uh, do you sell your paintings, or do you uh, I do on I do. Uh, do you have a uh, for, like private private site, or is it like through a uh, Representative. Also, I mean, pretty much, you know, I have my Instagram. If people contact me on there. Um, but uh, if, if if where I list them for sales, actually, on comic art fans. Oh, so I've got a gallery okay. on there, and and if you go on there, that's uh, that's where you'll find them. So um, cool. I don't know when you're planning on airing this, but uh, all, I'm actually going to have a 24-hour flash sale on Halloween. Um, so I'll have 20% off anything that's in my comic art fans galleries. Can we air this after that, guys, so that I can? Well, well we, will, we will actually. <laughs> it plans on dropping on Halloween, so it's actually. Uh, oh, perfect. Mikey, there you go. Okay, head, cool. Head so I'll wake up real early. I'll go to comic art fans in the morning. I'll buy what I want. <laughs> and then everyone can get my leftovers. 
<laughs> and then he, then he'll put new stuff the next day. And you're like, crap! I yeah. wanted the new you stuff. Out. <laughs> you want the I, sales I, stuff. I desperately want. I desperately want one of those those ones that look like the monsters from film, the famous monsters of film. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That I mean, I love all your work, but those are those crushed me when I saw it. I'm like, oh my god, I have to have that on my wall. Yeah, That's there's, be a, there's wall. those are mostly commissions, and and they're usually the only time I ever kind of get a body of them together is when I do a convention uh, back when we did conventions uh, yeah. at Monster Palooza. I would uh, generally have a body of them, but mostly those aren't on, oh, oh, uh, on a commission basis, and I'm usually backed up about four or five on those. So uh, mm. commissions are not available right now on, on one of those. <laughs> no, they're, they stay, those sell faster than I can paint them, which is a good place yeah. to be. But yeah, people yeah. love the, the classic monsters, and I love painting them, so but uh, we'll talk yeah. after after we stop pressing after we press <laughs> stop recording we'll check. Yeah, you, you have a site too and there's tons of fantastic images on, yeah. on your site too yeah i need to update my website i don't update it that often just because it's so easy now with instagram it's such mm -hmm. a easy streamlined way to just constantly post whatever artwork you get done that i'm i'm pretty lazy about updating my website that's where you just put the link in where when instagram and it'll just drop it on your website as well like you just put a little embedding thing and boom there it is yeah, yeah, I should do that. So, but no, that's that's all. Yeah, your Instagram's ridiculous. I love I love flipping through the different paintings that you have that when you post them, I'm like, oh, especially when you drop. Now that I know you're when you're doing these Marvel covers because I buy mainly Marvel, I'm like, sweet. Now I can, I don't have to go chase a dark horse book that I wasn't gonna read because of the art. Now I can buy this one <laughs> and read it. So right. Um, but I see right, you got Pete, the wraith in the background there too. You actually got one of the wraith in the background. Oh yeah, I, I was so excited to track that down. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's it. Yeah, this is it, the story was okay, but I love this art. It was just so good. It's uh, so good. With the motorcycle yeah. and everything. Like, what are you given? Like, hey, an issue early so you can sort of interpret what you want to do, or do you, they just give you a? Ooh, oh, look, a, that. Oh, <laughs> look at that! <laughs> Put your comic book away. I want to see this. <laughs> yeah, that. that no trade dress. That's much better for the trade dress. <laughs> <laughs> so for for that one, uh, I don't remember what they gave me for that. To be honest, I don't think they gave me much information on that. They basically just said, "Hey, we want you know, here's this wraith cover, or wraith character who I wasn't really that familiar with, but now I love him. I went I went and read everything on him, and uh, I think he's awesome. I, I think yeah. he's a great character. And now he's dead. You know, we'll <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts. But, uh, <laughs> that, that, but yeah, he's, he's a great the character. Point part of the story. You're like, really? <gasps> no. But that's awesome, General Ursus. Oh my gosh, that's insane! It's so that good. I do have that is available actually. <laughs> Mike's so crap. I should not have to commit now. <laughs> it's a lot easier to wish and not have it not be available than to <laughs> like what Chris. Chris, we need to start getting crappier artists on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Spending all of Mike's money. You are. Oh man. Uh, all right, Pete. What you got for your third book here? <laughs> oh, let me see. What do I got for my third book here? Magic. All right. With my third book, I did shift it over from the alien possession over more towards the uh, demon possession. I wanted to use the uh, Magic Four cover. Yeah, with that magic where she's kind of like like sending crisscross applesauce Indian style, like floating in the air. But I couldn't find it in a box, so I went with the this X and Furnace cover because oh. one, it's it's just gorgeous. And two, it also gives more of a that possessed look because she's got like those uh, almost like the goat legs and the you know the horns coming out of her head. Like it's this is beautiful. So I just picked this just for mostly for the cover. You're looking at the horns. <laughs> <laughs> Poor <Yes. me. laughs> No, that's Finch's covers that entire little series. I have three out of the four. They're all gorgeous. Like here's they the other two. Everything great, Finch and you get the amazing. possession eyes on all of them. Yeah, I'm so yeah. jealous of that guy. Everything he does is gold. I mean, he's so nice too. I met him last year in Memphis, and uh, he was just—he was really great to talk to. I brought him up. I had a page, like a Wonder Woman page from his from his run, and uh, he was—he like he, he looked at every line, just looking at it, and just remember. You could tell he was reminiscing about doing yeah. the page. I'm like, it's just kind of a nothing page. But, well, I mean, it's a good page, but um, but it was it was really great to talk to him. He was a super nice guy. He's, I just met him through email actually. So. And, and I've been a huge fan of his forever. And I actually got to meet him. So I kind of, you know, fanned out a little bit while emailing back and forth. <laughs> yeah, him, so. he's so talented. Yeah, so he's, he's great. He, he's he got like that, oh, like a Jim Lee quality, a little bit of Sylvester as well with that like cross hatching. But he uses a heavier black than those two ever did. And it's yeah, just, yeah. 
I, I dig it. Yep, I do too. All right. Well, for my last book, uh, going a little, I haven't really, I, I like to just do, so I'm going with a big size Superman Fantastic Ooh. Four Alex uh-huh. Ross uh, cover, uh, Dan Jurgens. Uh, but uh, it's Galacticus. It's basically Superman becoming one of the heralds of Galacticus. So when you talk about possession and everything, uh, I sort of leaned on like, okay, well, how does, well, all the heralds, they have that little imbu- imbued part of, the Galacticus power, so they he yeah, does yeah. possess them, and you have to. So, but I I couldn't. I was I've always wanted an excuse to use this giant thing. These things are stupid <laughs> books that <laughs> have no place in a house because they don't fit in any box. So you, yeah. if you own one, you're like, well, what the hell do I do with it now that I have it? Outside of it being just a fantastic piece of art, and that's pretty much what it is. I think at this time Ross did this. He did the um, Kingdom Come books that were just giant ones as well. That with the great Wonder Woman and. Like there's like four or five of them from that Kingdom Come, come uh, storyline, but this is just, this is just sort of fun. The interiors, of course, never as good as, but they're still really good. And you get a uh, what's the uh, the Superman that the Manhunter Superman, uh, Henry Henry Clay or the oh yeah 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 the uh, cyborg he's in one, here yeah. like yeah, and you get of course of course in crossovers just sort of fun. I always wish the crossover stories were actually better than they ever are. I haven't really, really wet one that I'm like, oh, that's perfect. I love it. It was perfect combination of everything. Chris, uh, tough for those things. Nobody want. They all want to say face. You don't want to have like, you know, no company wants to give away to say your guy's better than my guy. <laughs> Time, life, bags and boards. Yes, I actually have long, long, longitudinally in a CGC short box. So flip them. Okay, so put them like this way. Yep, they fit. <sighs> So now you, gotta, I mean, you, have to dedicate, you have to dedicate a box for that size, but yeah. treasuries fit that way and those fit that way. Okay, well, so well, that means I need to buy a, a barricade more. to get a, a barricade <laughs> that goes long ways, so you can put it in a box like that. And you can buy you can buy onesie twosies of those bags and boards at GE. Yeah, I have I actually have a stack of I know I have the magazines inside. You, it's ridiculous. You have magazine size and you have Life magazine size. Yeah, it's got to be Life magazine size. <laughs> yeah, magazine size ain't gonna cut that. Oh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> but sorry. Speaking of geeking out. <laughs> uh, well, e, thank you for joining us. Uh, do you? You said you had some stuff you're working on. Can is there anything you can tell us that hey, this is coming out in the next few weeks? That or anything that you can say? Because I I love seeing your stuff. Like the the the, the, the next thing I know you have is the Conan nullified but I, i'm sure there's been right. you have like seven things going out that you just can't tell us actually right now just coincidentally because of uh covid scheduling i actually have eight covers coming out in the next two months oh, uh, dang. oddly enough Ooh. yeah and so in december i have uh oh wait no so it's starting so december and january i have eight books coming out next month i have just no i have two so i have conan whatever number of conan that they're on i think 13, 14, 15? Uh, 16, it'll be 16 next 16 so yeah, 16 I'll find for it. november whatever it is whatever whatever's coming out in uh in in november it's either 15 or 16 and then i have uh issue one of the stranger things uh D uh that they're doing <gasps> from dark horse D. nice yeah so oh, it's basically nice. all the boys playing dungeons and dragons so it's like a little side story it's their oh, characters wow. actually in the dungeon and dragon world and i think it has a framing element of the boys sitting around and you know, kind That's of doing cool. their downtime thing. Uh, so kind of similar to one of the old X-Men stories where they're playing basketball. It's just sort of this sort of side story. So it's a, That's a the stuff I love art. that stuff. X-Men playing basketball. Yeah, it's really cool. The, the book is great. And, and it's written by uh, Jim, Jim Zub. And so it's the same guy that's writing Conan. Uh, so oh. uh, it's going to be good. So you know it's going to be good. Um, so, that, uh, so the first issue of that's coming out. So I have those two coming out in November. In December, we have... Uh, the again the next conan which price 17 so 17 and 18 actually 17 and 18 come out in december and my uh, uh nullified variant i think that's four mm. four seventeen. is that is that hmm. is that the variant four number 17 something like that i think so because it, it coincides with the king of black or whatever run oh, yeah. right. that is right. december, so, december drop yeah right so i have three three conan covers coming out in december uh, and then uh, and a <laughs> an issue two of Stranger Things D and D. So those all four come out in December. 
And then January, I have a Werewolf by Night variant for issue four, Ooh. Werewolf by Night. Uh, yeah. Hasn't been revealed yet, hasn't been shown. Actually, I showed it, they let me show it on, that's not true, I, I got to show it on my Instagram. They haven't released it yet, they let me show it on my Instagram. Um, okay, so, that, so that, that means we can got... show it now. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Grab absolutely. Yeah, go, go grab it off of my Instagram, or if you, or if you want one, uh, if you want to hire a res image, just uh, email me and I'll send it over to you. Okay. Uh, so I've got that uh, coming out, uh, issue four, um, which again was was pre-COVID originally. And so, you know, again, things yeah. get shuffled around. Is, and, I know uh, you did some Morbius covers. Are they still doing Morbius? I, I believe the series is still running. I did the variant for issue two, I okay. think it was. I couldn't remember um, if you were doing that. They had two. like so, yeah, I did so the many different for variants. Issue two. Okay. So many variants for, for that series. Yeah, they did a ton of them. Great ones, too. Really good ones. Yeah. Um, I wish mine had been better. <laughs> I liked mine, but there were some really good ones on there. But yours um, harkens back, if I recall, it harkens back to like the old Nosferatu sort of evil, like just it wasn't as a sexy Morbius. It was. No, a... no, very gothic <laughs> horror. Very gothic yeah. horror. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun. Um, and then not I Jared Leto, Morbius. No, 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 no Leto tattooed up here. <laughs> uh, Gold teeth. You don't want the grill. And then what else do I have that month? I have so I have Conan, a variant for Conan nineteen. I have uh, issue three of uh, of Stranger Things D and D. I have uh, Werewolf by Night. Do you have any more of the Warhammer? Oh, and actually, this this is this is a, a a fresh off hot off the presses. I am doing a variant cover for. Uh, I think I can say this because I think they I think they announced that I am doing the cover, but I'm doing a cover for Savage Avengers with uh, Conan and Deadpool. Oh, oh that's fun! Oh, so, cool. Yeah, that's that's literally what's on my easel right now. I'm finishing off this week, so uh, so that hasn't been shown yet. But uh, but I, I I hope they announced my name. I think they did. In the last preview guide, uh, so so yeah, so those will be my four covers in January. So nice. wow, so you're doing, and some of it's just because of COVID, but you've gone from your name is becoming, I guess more con like I didn't like when I started when we reached out to you like I I loved your covers I'd seen, but man, you got like one every month now, or not one four every month. Uh, yeah, the, uh, like the, the, this is a freak thing. I mean, I can do. <laughs> two, maybe three covers a month on top of my teaching, maybe. I mean, two, yeah. I can do pretty comfortably. Three, that's I start getting in trouble with three. Um, <laughs> so I, four, I couldn't do four covers a, a month. That's Again, that's just several of those were, were COVID covers that are just finally now yeah. coming out. So um, well, plus we were we were way ahead on the on the Stranger Things D&D. &D. So the first issue mm -hmm. hasn't even come out yet. And I've been done with that for almost a month. Okay. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of lead time on that yeah. um, just well, because of the whole painting. licensing thing. Well, yeah, you got to paint them. But uh, whenever you have like multiple layers of approval. So because it's so much, we have approval for Netflix. We have approval from uh, mm -hmm. uh, Wizards of the Coast. We have approval from IDW. And there's just there's a lot of layers of approval. So you want to make sure that you're way out ahead of that in case one of them goes, hey, yeah. you know, no, we don't one like of that, them is uh... going to. Yeah, we, right. we don't like that part of the image. You need to tweak that. And if you're painting it, it's not as easy as maybe digitally you can. All right, well, I can clear this off. Or, I mean, I you have to paint all of the black. Can't there right are a couple of digital there. tweaks to those. but uh, So, I mean, I, I, I am capable of doing digital if I have to. And there are some digital tweaks to those. It actually usually wasn't things that they wanted taken out. It was usually things they wanted added in. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Netflix wanted, wants Stranger Things imagery in there. D&D &D wants to make sure that... You know, their stuff is so everyone kind of wants it's like doing a movie poster, right? All the actors, you know, want their head the biggest type of thing. So, <laughs> so you just you know, enlarge here, turn here. OK, right. <laughs> there's a lot of different masters to play K2. Okay. There, yeah. there were pretty minor changes. There wasn't anything. We didn't run into any any major problems on it, which actually kind of surprised me a little bit with with so many cooks in the kitchen. But no, it, it, yeah. it actually ended up being a, a pretty good experience. And, the, and I was happy with that. It came out so. Yeah. I'm just thinking of some of the artists we've talked to who've done di things digitally, how they said, oh, it's easy if we they, they say move the hand a little bit, that they can right. just kind of cut and move it. Whereas if you painted it, you can't just move it. you got to repaint the whole hand or if, whatever. If you want to have the original be the same. Uh, uh, but yeah. if it's something like that, I mean, if I if I don't necessarily care or if I don't agree with it, I'll do it digitally. And I'll keep the original the way okay. that, that I want it. So That's awesome. Uh, and again, there's a lot of factors. You know, when I say I don't agree with it, I don't mean that, you know, 
I, I understand their decision making, but sometimes it's like, oh, this needs to be moved because it's going to be covered up by the title or, you know, whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. a lot of factors involved. Um, there's, yeah, it could just be easier just to do it yeah. digitally than it is to repaint totally. the whole thing just to, for a slight tweak. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, oh, thanks thank for you so much. Me. It was yeah, really. I learned we learned fun. so much, and once again, we're spending Mike's money, so it's always good. Um, <laughs> I already <laughs> bought my money. Too. I already bought or that the, whatever that Halloween special is already in the cart, man. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're planning on uh, hopefully Halloween episode. Uh, we it was perfectly timed to have you on with all the, your amazing, ridiculous horror covers. It's great mm-hmm. to hear a fan too, like. You're not just doing this because you like you. You're doing covers of things you like, and that's no, that. The, that's why we love doing the show is when we get to find out this is your passion. You love talking hard. I mean, seriously, go to CBSI and read the Valverde incident articles on Sundays because if you want to go nerd out, and we can connect you to the guy if you want to nerd out with the guy. Yeah. He, he <laughs> his alien knowledge, like he wears us out, yeah. but he's amazing. Clint <laughs> is awesome. I love yeah. Clint. Yeah, he is. So, but uh, yes, thank you so much uh, once again, guys. Yeah, no this is Three Comic Money comicbookinvest.com so and thank you great to meet you thanks so much for your time all right guys thanks a lot